January 15th meeting of the Mountain Run Curry Board of School Directors at 3 for 6.35 p.m. Um, first order of business, public comment. Any public comment? Okay. Uh, no, it's um, consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda. So move to approve to approve the consent agenda. Approve it. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I have a quick question for you, Jim. Yes. At the outset, I wasn't certain where this should go. Jerry and I were talking at the beginning about the quantity of paper that we received this time, and both she and I rely on digital documents yeah. primarily. And I was just wondering, I understand some people probably prefer paper and some people don't. Yep. But for those who don't want this much paper, and I, I don't really need it, and it seemed like that was the case for Jerry too, I thought maybe we could figure out how many of these need to go out versus how many don't. I just wanted to throw that out there so that we could reduce the quantity of paper and the time that Anna spends on this. Um, I'll kind of defer to Anna. I mean, my initial thought is since the thick packages are relatively rare, that having to keep track of, that we're probably not saving a ton of paper and having to keep track of who wants it and who does it might be more work than just printing out nine copies. But if you feel differently, I'm happy to save paper. But I appreciate that, but it will also not be hard for me to get all of your preferences and accommodate. Okay. Yeah, so if you want to let, uh, I don't know that you don't want hard copies. Mm. Um, yeah, great. Yeah. I'll connect with all of you and ask your questions. Yeah, all right, perfect. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, our students are not here today. Okay. Uh, and did we, we had a vote on the consent agenda, didn't we? But did he have um, yeah. All right, so we are fast forwarding to uh, sure, the grants to light, the budget, uh, and warning approval. We're skipping the busing? busing? No, where was the busing? It's underneath the students. We can do grant first. Oh, okay. I just, I just saw Larry. No, let's, uh, let's talk about busing. Sorry. Okay. So Andrew is not here. We had a little miscommunication, but I can talk about this as well. Um, so as most of you know, the, um, when we were picking up students from Main Street Middle School in the afternoon, the 15-minute the period of time there um, has caused some consternation in the community. Um, and so we continue to, look, we're continuing to look at this. The plan that um, was suggested to us by I believe the chief of police, but it, in the meeting that I had with the chief of police and fire, this, the idea was suggested, could we have the buses come through Peck Place, which is a little tiny street mm -hmm. right behind middle school, through the playground, out the, the basketball courts, and out, turn out, I mean, pick up the kids on the playground, out Main Street. Um, so uh, I had Andrew, and we had to hire an engineer anyway to look at the basketball court because that's part of the capital project is to um, get the drainage fixed and things on the basketball court. So an engineer was already coming out to look at that space. So I asked Andrew to add it to the engineer's docket to look at this, the playground space in general and can it hold the weight of buses on that or would we have to do significant work to that area in order to hold the weight of buses. Um, so Don McLean, he's a resident from Liberty Street, lives real, right near Jay Nichols. Can't remember him. <laughs> Looking at my mom, peel your folks. I mean, the first name's Don. <laughs> um, Don came out and looked at it a couple different times by himself. Um, gave us a very large number. Said, yeah, we can make this work. Um, this is what it's gonna cost you in order to make it work. Um, and then on Monday, Andrew, myself, Don, Zach from the Department of Public Works here in Montpelier, um, and Glenn, the head custodian over at Main Street, were out there for about an hour, an hour and a half at 7.30 in the morning, looking at just the area in general. Could, and it was great to be out there then because there were snow banks and you know, there was some logistics that we wouldn't have thought of had we not been out there in the middle of winter. <laughs> 
So we were looking at, could, we had Stacey Emerson too coming from the bus garage, but she unfortunately got sick, so she couldn't make it. So we were looking at, could the bus make that turn? Um, what would we have to do to the property? Um, and, and overwhelmingly, the group decided we just couldn't make this happen. If it were, if it's like tomorrow where it's supposed to snow all day, we don't have the capacity to keep the snow away. We wouldn't have the capacity to be able to plow it out. Um, we'd have very large snow banks throughout the winter in the middle of our playground and it would virtually make three quarters of our, that playground, which is very small in the first place, be not usable for kids because it would have to go through the, bus, the basketball court and all that kind of stuff. And um, it, just, it just wouldn't work. I mean, thankfully we were there in the winter and it's just not gonna work. And it was extraordinarily expensive to, to make that. And we could make the bus turn, we could get through Peck Place, we could do all of that, we could pick up all the kids there, that's not the issue. But when you look at the logistics of that operation and what we have the capacity for and what the Department of Public Works has the capacity for, the group just decided this was not a way that we could go forward. Um, I'm happy to keep going with that investigation. However, I think there's a lot of things that we have to overcome in order to make that work. So we're back to having to figure out the best place to pick up kids, not directly on our school property. Uh, the building committee is asking that as a question. So I look at Tina and Andrew. Mm -hmm. The building committee has asked that, you know, that's a need that the school has, and we're looking at needs and assets of the building right now. So that is part of the, uh, the Main Street Middle School Building Committee work, as like, this is a need. That's what listed on there, a place for safe drop pickup at the end of the day. Um, we were talking about um, Franklin Street. But the, right, the one right next to the middle yep. school. Yep. Mm -hmm. Franklin Street has no parking on one side of it. And um, up to the first driveway, we, we were literally out there pacing out buses. We could fit three buses, we believe, there on Franklin Street without blocking one driveway, at a three at a time. But then don't you block the street? Yeah. The whole street of Franklin Street? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, for the 15 minutes of picking, well, it would be longer. So, so that is the only other feasible option that we could come up with besides Cross Street is that if you park three buses there, it, we'd have to change um, our we'd have to change our routine at the end of the day because you can't let walkers go. Then you can't just let all the kids go because now you have buses that you have to compete with. So if we change the logistics of the end of the school day, which is a possible thing to do. You would have, we would have three buses at a time, the same three buses start, you know, get there first, get to Union first, drive over to Main Street, and three buses get to Union, drive over to Main Street. It makes the bus pick up considerably longer. Um, so Franklin Street would be blocked off for a longer period of time. Um, and it would block the street because you have to have the red lights flashing. Um, and then the third option is to continue with Cross Street the way it is. Um, so. As I said on Monday at the building committee, because we were talking about this, um, there is no good answer. <laughs> there is no great spot um, or perfect solution to this. So it's really what's the best of the worst that influences the least amount of people. Um, and I'm not sure between Cross Street or Franklin Street if there is a least amount of people. I think it's an equal, it's an equal challenge. Go ahead, I mean, I I'm trying to picture this since I walked there all the time, but I, just what occurred to me is the fact that the three buses on Franklin Street wouldn't block a driveway doesn't seem particularly relevant since you wouldn't be able to use the street. The you street could, you'd have, have to go, go across. around. It yeah. would if you were Well, you can't go the other way on Franklin Street. Yeah, you can. Is it too, yeah, you yeah, you can go down you from like drive. north. You could go, yeah. yeah, you can go across to North yeah. Street. Mm -hmm. and, oh, right, yeah. yeah. Okay, so you around could go back, out that way. Which is how the buses and would have to leave yeah. to get out of there. And why it is important is if you're one of the people that can't get out of your driveway because the bus is blocking your driveway on Cross Street, that would be important. Right, no, no, I was just trying to imagine the Franklin Street. And if, if, you yeah. could, if you could use the unblocked driveway anyway. There like, was one it, driveway can, that, yeah. that, would look, that looks blocked, yeah. but <laughs> Zach, because he was in his public works uniform, <laughs> um, actually went down the driveway, and that driveway ex ex exits out Main Street. So the one driveway that appears to be blocked actually isn't, because they can access Main Street through a different direction. So. Um, the other challenge, though, is that you have three buses there, and the other three buses are either on their way or they are on blocking Liberty, waiting for those th the three buses on Franklin to leave. Mm -hmm. So 
So there is a challenge with timing. We have six buses? We have six buses. And they all go to the middle school? Yes. yes. So, um, so that's a, the police have, and fire have already told us that Liberty with double-sided parking, and especially in the winter with the snow banks, that that is a non-starter. You yeah. cannot do that. So, um, and there's no way to have them like swap like three at Union, three at Middle, and then the, the three go the other places so that they're essentially taking up the same amount of time. I think that that would cause, we would have probably about a half hour dismissal schedule then. It would take, it would take a pretty good chunk out of academic time. Mm -hmm. We can, I'm not saying it's not possible, you know, we could do that. Um, however, it's, do they, yeah. do they load on Cross Street now? Yes. We load the middle schoolers on Cross Street. So the buses drive up on Cross Street, the kids are there, get on the bus, and they leave. It's about a 15 minute process. And what's, how does it compare to this, the pickup at Union? Because I'm always, is it? It is the exact same as the pickup at Union. In terms of the disturbance in the neighborhood? Oh no, I think the disturbance at the Union is, is much more. Because the at, Union, at Union, is more? At, yeah, at Union, okay. you're blocking off Park Street, which isn't a huge challenge because there are not too many houses on Park Street, but you're blocking off Park Street. I know you did. <laughs> but, it, but at Union, the added challenge is that you have a considerable amount of parents, as I know, I know you know because I've seen you in the line, picking kids up from School Street. Mm -hmm. So at Union Pickup, not only is Park Street blocked off, but pretty much all of School Street is blocked off mm -hmm. because of parents, mm -hmm. not buses. Um, and so there's more challenge at Union, except it's been happening for however long, and people are used to it, and it's just the way it is. And um, So you, we're blocking, the district is blocking a considerably, a considerable more amount of houses at, at Union than at Main Street. But it's important to know or to note, rather, that you know, this has been going on for a long time at Union Elementary School, and this change at that Main Street Middle School, this is new. Oh, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, um, I think we probably, as it's really probably city administration, probably the school board, everybody probably could have done a little bit better job of doing some outreach at the front of this mm -hmm. with regard to those residents in that area. Um, and so that's something that we discussed with those residents and we've been discussing with those residents quite a bit as part of the building committee, the Main Street Middle School Building Committee. They've really been the only members of the public who have been engaged. And that's really, you know, we're happy to have their engagement, but that's really the only issue that they um, have yeah. articulated yeah. concern about. So, so we might consider in, uh, as we go forward to have more of a discussion with all of the community members that surround that building, because maybe they have an idea that we haven't thought of. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, and I'm, I'm not trying to just miss any concern. I'm just trying to see if, if, if we've created a situation in middle school that's comparatively different than what the neighborhood around. It, it is less disruptive at, at Main Street Middle School than it is for the neighborhood that surrounds Union Elementary School. But it is, it is a new challenge. For them. But it is a new disruption for them. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we're going to keep talking about this. I just wanted to, Andrew and I were talking and we said we should probably apprise the board about the fact that the Peck Place option is not an option. I, don't, I just don't see it being feasible. Um, and the Public Works Department didn't see it being feasible either in terms of keeping that clear for, for buses. It's yeah, too bad because I was thinking that. so minimal already. Yeah. To have That's exactly what we were talking it. about. It's just sad. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the plowing that yeah, would yeah. eliminate basketball and things like that. Yeah. So it's a it's a conundrum and a challenge <laughs> that we're we're gonna still work on. Okay. Good. Well thanks for giving us any other questions or comments on that? So Grant. Okay. Some earlier than anticipated, but uh, Um, I didn't bring any hard copies because there's only a handful of slides that changed, so we sent it out to you. Um, is there a set? Thanks, Dan. There we go. So, 
I'm going to just skip to the slides. Uh, this whole thing will be present um, will be posted on the website, but there's only a few slides I wanted to go over. So I'm going to start with changes. From the last meeting to now, the only thing that changed is equalized pupil count. And I wish I could say it changed because this is the final number, but it isn't. So we did get a count from the AOE. Our numbers are in, but the count came in at just under 1,240. And if you recall, I've been using 1,245, or at least that's what I used the last time. So it was lower than what we expected. And whenever I dug into it a little bit, I found that there's an ELL tab for English language learners. And on that tab, I looked up Montpelier and Roxbury, and there were no kids listed, zero. We've got like 61, I think. Um, so I thought, oh great, this is still another problem unique to us. But then I started looking up and down, and it's not unique to us. There are a bunch of school districts that have zero ELL kids on this sheet that should have ELL kids. It's a big deal because there's a weighting factor for ELL. So one ELL student is actually weighted as 1.2 students. So those kids are in our data that got submitted, but they're just not designated as ELL. So we're only getting credit for one instead of 1.2 for each one of those kiddos. So we just got an email, or I just got an email from the AOE today saying, no, you're not gonna get a new equalized, frozen equalized pupil number today, nor tomorrow, nor this week. Maybe next week you will. Maybe not, um, because they now are trying to figure out what all the districts need to do to submit their data in a way that the statewide longitudinal data system can pick it up and plug it in. So um, it will be a while, um, but we can kind of make our good estimate on this. If there's 61 kids times a weighting factor of 0.2, that's 12.2 kids that should be added and we know the number was just under 1240. So I'm, you'll see on a, a slide later, I've upped our equalized pupil count from 1245 to about 1251 or 1252, I forget, you'll see it in a minute. I think that's a pretty stable number. I don't think it will adjust by much. Um, the reason why I can't get it nailed down exactly is because the AOE will throw some equalizing ratio, some percentage against everybody's numbers and I have no idea what that's going to be. It might drop down a little bit, which would make everybody's numbers come down a little bit. But um, I'm, unless I'm not seeing something, uh, I think the equalized pupil count that I've got on the slides that's factored into the warning should be very close. And in the warning itself, it says words like estimated, projected. So I'm not worried as long as we're close. And I think we are close. So the next slide I wanted to skip to is, so this at a glance slide. So you can see now instead of 1245, I'm, I'm using a number that's almost 1252. And while that's still an estimate, it's pretty, it should be pretty darn close. So when you plug that number in, and this goes up by almost seven kids, then this number of course went down. I think it was 17, 060 last time, so the spending per pupil came down about $100. And now it's a 3.77 increase instead of, I think it was 3. Point, well, I've got it written down here, but I can't see because it it's too dark in here. 4.34 <laughs> is what it used to be. Um, so that slide changed. And then I'm really going to skip way forward and go to the tax rate calculation because none of these obviously have changed at all. The staffing, the expenses, I didn't change any expenses or revenues. Grant, mm -hmm. you, you got an estimate from the state on the yield mm -hmm. and that happened before they discovered that they were missing a lot of bodies? <clears throat> no, the, the yield... Um, the yield shouldn't really play into equalized pupil counts. Really? Because equalized pupil counts is really just shifting the counts okay. around. So they know how many kids there are in Vermont. That's why there's this equalizing ratio, because <laughs> everybody gets these factors weighed in. Okay. And so you may have 
1,100 kids, but your equalized pupil count initially comes out at like 1,200. Got it. And then the AOE will multiply that by like 0.93 okay. to get you back down to 1,100 real kids. So the ed, I see. So the ed fund isn't just divided by the number of equalized pupils. No. It's actually to get yield. It's actually then uh, neutralized effectively. Yeah, the ed right. fund is going to be looking at the education spending number. This oh, 21240. Right. Right. It's much more complex than I recall. Yeah. Right. And so the, now this residential tax rate, you've got the new equalized pupil count. I already told you about the, how that impacts this. The yield that Steve's talking about, this 11,000, the tax commissioner's recommendation was 10,883. Initially, um, I was thinking maybe I would drop this back down from 11,000 to the tax commissioner's recommendation because we're hearing a lot about the statewide health negotiations might cause some districts to see some increase in their expenses. Some significant, not so much us because of how we already had our health plan in, in place. But some districts weren't offering health plans to all employees or all health plans to all employees. So there may be some higher cost. So initially people were thinking, well, that might drive up ed, the ed fund and that might cause this dollar yield to have to go down some. But um, internet sales tax revenue is up uh, significantly, like $8 million. So the last time I had a conversation with um, a friend of mine at the AOE, he projected that the yield would go up from the tax commissioner recommendation. So because of that, I left it at 11,000. As Steve and I were talking about before the meeting started, a lot of times, we go with the recommendation, we go to town meeting, we show them what the tax rate calculation comes out at, and then through the legislative process, the dollar yield ends up getting set higher. Tax rates are even lower than what you told the public you know, it was going to be. So I think 11,000 is really my best guess at what this would be. And I wanted to basically give what I think the best estimate of a tax rate would be. Can I just add one thing to that, just so everyone's aware? The sales and use tax now goes entirely to the Ed Fund. And that change occurred um, as the Supreme, around a similar time that the Supreme Court ruled that states could collect sales tax on remote sales into their state, which is how a lot of retail is occurring these days via online sellers. And so that revenue that Grant was just talking about, the online sales, that's that's a new thing the state's able to get. And also because that happened at the same time that sales and use tax was shifted to the Ed Fund, that's helping to relax the pressure on property tax rates a little bit. So I, I think we've got about as good a guess as we can get on a lot of these. What did come in, I think we talked about it last time, the CLAs came in. Um, I was pretty close on Montpelier. I think it was you know, like maybe 0.3% off what the actual number came in. Um, we talked about it last time. In Roxbury, I was taken off guard because the CLA actually went up by 0.5, which was shocking because it dropped almost 6% last year. So for it to turn around and go up. But there are not a lot of houses in Roxbury. So if there's a few sales that take place, it could really swing things. So um, it works out great for the tax rate for Roxbury. Um, and I did want to give you some context, this box at the bottom. What that's telling you is if the CLA was identical in FY21 to what it was in 20, meaning if in Montpelier it was still 89.67%, the tax rate would be 5.4 cents lower than what it is. So the tax rate is going up 8.4 cents in Montpelier, 5.4 of the 8.4 is because this CLA dropped from 89 to 87, or 89.7 to 86.9. Um, but anyhow, this I think is as good as we can get right now, and probably will be as good as it gets for quite a while, because I don't think we're going to get an equalized pupil number until at the earliest, maybe the end of next week. And we do have to get our articles done and information submitted to the municipalities for the annual reports. I updated this. The Roxbury numbers didn't change at all. Um, Montpelier changed a little bit. That was a $94 increase because it was 9.4 cents. Now it's 8.4. So the Montpelier impacts have changed a little bit. I did say that the numbers could change slightly based on a final equalized pupil count. 
It could also change based on a dollar yield getting set differently at the end of the legislative session. Let's see. I think there was two or three more slides I wanted to show. Oh. I updated this tax rate history slide to um, just to put in the latest numbers. And once again, this is just trying to call out that if you look at FY18 compared to FY21 without CLA being factored in, Montpelier's tax rate is 2.6 cents lower in FY21, projected to be 2.6 cents lower in FY21 than it was in FY18. If you look at Roxbury, 26 cents lower without in the um, CLA as a factor. In Roxbury, even when you factor in CLA, it's still lower. The 1.716 versus 1. So it's 10.6 cents lower in Roxbury, the actual tax rate. While in Montpelier, of course, once you factor in the CLA, which is dropping every year, it's actually like a 10.6 cent increase. And as Andrew pointed out at the last meeting, you look at that 10.6 cents across three years, that's 6.6 percent increase. Over, if you divide that by three years, that's a 2.2 percent increase in actual tax rate per year. 2.2 is well below inflation. So I think we're doing pretty good as far as controlling the tax rate as, as much as we can. Um, the budget summary slide is a little different now, so I updated the numbers. Um, I think the ed spending number is still the same. Yeah, it would be, still 4.7. But the increase in per pupil spending now is 3.8 instead of 4 point something because of the increase in equalized pupils. And then just, you know, the tax rates is based on these things, pupil count, statewide dollar yield, CLA. Montpelier right now, it's a 5.1% increase but the majority of it is really associated with CLA. If we didn't have to factor in CLA, it would be a 1.8% increase in the actual tax rate. Roxbury, of course, is decreasing 5.5%. It would decrease even more, but while we're getting that two cent, or it's now, what, six cents, um, that um, merger incentive, um, that tax rate break, while you're getting that tax rate break, you can only decrease your, equal, er, your um, tax rate by 5%, your equalized tax rate by 5% per year. And since the CLA went up, we actually see that number grow a little bit. So instead of 5%, it's 5.5. And then this would be time for questions. Before I get there, though, I just wanted to, to uh, point out um, we are getting down to it. Um, so my recommendation is for a motion to approve the total budget of 25-324-090, which includes the 270 capital plan. You will see two different numbers in the warning. You'll see the number without the capital and then a separate article that's the capital, because you have to do it that way. Um, but it's voted on all at the same time. It's, it's not a separate vote. It is, it is. It is a separate, separate article, so it's two, two separate votes. votes. You can vote yes on the, just the overall budget and no on the general fund or vice versa. It gets a little wonky if somebody approves the capital without approving the budget. Which they budget. sometimes do. But it, it can happen. Yep. But to um, remind folks that the tax rate includes the 270000 It yeah. does. Right. It's not extra. Right. Um, so if you're okay with it, that would be the motion to approve that budget. And then also a motion to authorize the board chair to sign the warning, which I, we sent that out to you as well. And I believe um, there's a hard copy for Jim to sign if you approve that. But now, after that, we can go back and circle to any kind of questions that anybody has. I mean, I know we've gone through the numbers, the expenses, the revenues, but um, we're really just down to now kind of tax rate type stuff. So if there's any questions or concerns, I can try to address them at this time. Thank you, Draft. Questions, concerns, comments? I, I don't have a question, but my concern is over a 5% increase in the budget, I think, is too much for a community that's already taxed a lot. I, I will say that I, um, I am sensitive to that sentiment, and I'm very, I was very anxious about this budget, but I, I thought it was important to look at the numbers over time. And if we look at 
from FY15 to FY20, five fiscal years, our tax rates in Montpelier related to education rose 4.7%. So that may, and in some of those years, they actually decreased. Mm -hmm. So over a five-year period, 4.7%, that reflects a lot of deferred maintenance and a lot of needs that weren't being met. And when I look at inflation over, over the same period that we're looking at, um, if we look at just you know, FY15 to FY20, when we had that 4.7% increase, inflation went up 8.66% during that period. So that means that our, our tax rates and our per pupil spending was, was roughly in line with those tax rates too. Our per pupil spending and our tax rates were less than inflation by, you know, in- Almost half. Yeah, almost half mm -hmm. of that. And so, yeah, this is a big year, 5.1%. I'm super sensitive to taxpayers and other burdens. But when I look at FY15 to FY21, that's a cumulative 10.1% increase and when we look at actual inflation and projected inflation based on the state economist projections, inflation's looking like 11.2%. So we're still looking at our tax rates being behind inflation by 1.1%, and our per pupil spending's even less than our tax rates. We're looking at 9.55% increase in per pupil spending over a, a six year period, which is so less than 10% over a six year period, which when you put it in that context, and when you look at some of the needs in our district, we're, do, we're doing well on many levels. I think it is important to keep that context in mind from a financial standpoint. Yeah, I think it's a good argument if you're basically pacing inflation, you're just keeping up. And I think we've made a lot of great strides you know, in the district in a, a budget context that I think a lot of people would say is just keeping pace with inflationary needs. Sure. I think the 3.8 percent per pupil spending is great. Um, that's that's the bottom line of what we need to be looking at is the per pupil amount, and a 3.8 percent increase I think is justified. I mean, I'm very comfortable justifying it, and I think people will be comfortable supporting it. I'm sensitive to the tax increases too, but I think, I think it's a very responsible budget. And I also feel that you know we had a few years where um, we actually had a year, a couple years where at least one year we had a negative tax increase. Two years. Two ago. years where our tax rate actually decreased. Declines. Yeah. So when you put it in an overall trajectory, it's um, it's part of a responsible, very responsible budgetary story. I move to approve the budget of $25,324,090, including the $270,000 capital fund. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. I'm opposed. Uh, ayes have it. Um, I move that we authorize the board chair to sign the warning. All in favor? I'm going to second. Second. Oh, sorry. Uh, All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Yeah, that passes as well. Congratulations. <laughs> Don't say that yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Grant, thank you. Yeah, but it's, it's thank extremely you. Thank you. you guys did a lot of good work. And, uh, I know you thought it through and uh, made some choices. And I, think it's a, I think it's a good budget for the kids. And um, well, now it's our job to sell it to the community. Do we need support from Grant or Libby to produce talking points or? I think they certainly well, would be appreciated. Do we all feel confident in distilling it from the presentations? I think some talking points would be great if you want to vote for the community and um, yeah, I'm, I would like to do an op-ed as well. Last year, we um, in the annual reports, I think it was last year that we started this, we, we did kind of a, a budget overview, a narrative of budget overview, like a one-page thing, which I think last year was the first year we did that. So I need to do that anyhow for the annual report. So I'll give that to, to Libby and, of course, and you'll be doing the superintendent's report as well. So we might start with those two documents to see if they come close to what you need, and then if you need something beyond that that's more basic or bulleted, then we can certainly work on that. Yeah, no, that would be great. And yeah, if you have something like that, we could probably turn it into talking points or something that we can 
distribute to community members so they understand the context and what's in the budget and, and it's, it's always very helpful so they know what they're voting on. Okay, great. I appreciate, as always, your, uh, your tenacity as we go through these processes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Grant. So we are well ahead of schedule, which is good. Um, so the next motion is for executive session for personnel. Um, so we don't need a special motion, we just need a motion to go to executive session. Anyone want to make it? Sure. I move that we enter executive session for the purpose of conducting personnel evaluation. Second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 